All right. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Jaylon Adley, and I'm the Managing Director at Refuge She, and I'm delighted to welcome you to our virtual open house. Thank you all for taking the time to join. I know that everyone's feeling pretty zoomed out at this point, so we really appreciate you joining us. Um, I'm thrilled to be introducing our new CEO, Joffrey Fige, who will introduce you to the rest of the team and our student representatives. First, I just want to get a few logistics out of the way. Um, please know that we are recording the event so that we can share it with folks who weren't able to join us today. Um, following the talks by our team, you'll hear from our student representatives. And then after that, we will be taking questions from the audience. To streamline that process, we ask you to submit your questions in the Q&A function um, throughout the session. And then our colleague Shelby will be collecting those questions and then we'll ask the team at the end of the session um, a few questions from the audience. Feel free to ask general questions to the whole team or specific questions to one team member if, if you want. Um, if we can't answer all questions, we're gonna do our best to do a follow-up after the event to make sure that everyone's questions are answered. And also please feel free to reach out to any of us individually following. All right, so we're gonna get started. Uh, so without further ado, I'm gonna pass it on to our new CEO, Joffrey, who's gonna kick us off and introduce the rest of the team. Thank you, Jaylan. Hello and good morning to everybody and good evening to those who are joining us in East Africa. I have the great, my name is Geoffrey Fige. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of Refugee. I have the great honor and privilege of daily waking up in the morning to serve a wonderful organization that is a dream builder. For close to two years, I have enjoyed the privilege of inspiring young refugee women to believe in themselves and pursue personal de destiny. Refugee was formerly called Heshima Kenya, commenced in the year 2008, arising from the work of two uh, uh, humanitarian uh, workers, uh, Anne Sweeney and Talin Good, who are our founders. They saw that unaccompanied and separated vulnerable refugee girls and children were falling through cracks of humanitarian support because of government policy around encampment. These children were not only traumatized, but often victims of gender-based abuse during their flight history. Our vision is that we believe every refugee girl, woman, and child deserves a life of dignity with equal access to safety, education, and economic empowerment. Our mission is to protect, educate, and empower orphaned, unaccompanied, and separated refugee girls and young women to build healthier and more resilient futures for themselves and their children. Now, refugee girls and young women have been the most vulnerable. They are the first to be trafficked for sex or child labor, the first to be exploited as tools of war, and the first to lose their childhoods. They are the last to be fed, the last to be enrolled in school, and too often the last to be valued and appreciated. Refugee supports refugee girls between the ages of 13 and 23 who have fled conflict in the war-torn countries in the Greater Lakes region in Africa. Typically, when war or conflict erupts, children and young women get displaced and separated from their parents. Now, these children face a myriad of challenges around such as lack of proper legal documentation, children become primary caregivers to their younger siblings and lack of medical care and also roadblocks due to declining global resettlement affect these children. Now, when they finally connect to refugee, we are able to provide them with a safe shelter, medical assistance, counseling and psychosocial support, education, childcare support and vocational training. Refugees integrated model provides holistic support to serve both the immediate and longer term needs of refugee girls, empowering participants to build skills and confidence to become catalysts for positive change in their communities. 
refugees approach is right-based, trauma-informed, girl-centered services to protect and empower refugee girls. We offer safe shelter, case management support, girl empowerment through education and vocational courses, mental health support through counseling, medical and legal aid, and community support. Ladies and gentlemen, we cannot serve with excellence the young refugee women and children without the dedication and expertise of our staff. I wish to introduce to you some of the key staff in refugee that passionately provide leadership and synergy to make sure that we continue to serve the young refugee women with excellence. Nancy Tamasha is our Associate Director of Safe House and Case Management. Joan Nyongesa is our legal and advocacy officer. Jelan Adli is our managing director, and she introduced herself earlier. Cimente Lila, who I proudly call my president, is a student council president here at Refugee. Chantal Zuzi is a senior fellow of student and alumni relations. She was a member of Refugee and went through Refugee. I want to take this opportunity to welcome my colleague, Joan Nyongesa, to take it up for me. Welcome, Joan. Many thanks, Geoffrey, and a very good morning to our guests and a good evening to my colleagues in Kenya. My name is Joan Nyongesa, the Legal Advocacy Officer for Refugee. First, let's take a quick look on the statistics. Globally, an, an unprecedented 70 million people around the world have been forced to leave their homes due to conflict and persecution. The refugee problem is therefore a worldwide problem. Among them, nearly 30 million are refugees. Over half of this number are under the age of 18. The refugee problem has three solutions to it, and they include voluntary repatriation, this simply means that uh, refugees reavail themselves of the national protection of their own country. This could be that the circumstances that led to their flight no longer exist. The second solution is local integration. This means that refugees are accepted to integrate in the country of asylum and possibly granted citizenship. And lastly, we have resettlement, which is the transfer of refugees to a third country. However, resettlement opportunities are shrinking world over. As part of providing a solution to this problem, Refugee has been able to facilitate resettlement processes of some of her beneficiaries to third country. Now, I want us to look at the refugee situation in Kenya. Kenya plays a host to a hundred of thousands of ref refugees and asylum seekers from diverse nationalities, including Somalia, Sudan, Rwanda, Burundi, Ethiopia, Eritrea, Uganda, among others. This has been caused by political instabilities in their countries of origin. As of December 2020, Kenya was hosting around half a million registered refugees and asylum seekers, majority of whom are from Somalia, followed by South Sudan and Congo, respectively. Nairobi and other urban centers had around 80,000 registered refugees and asylum seekers. 37% of this number are minors, and again, 49% are young girls and women. These young girls and women face strenuous journeys fleeing their home countries, and many arrive in Nairobi unaccompanied and separated, with very little access to safe shelter, food, medical care and education. Most do not speak English or Swahili and face high risks of abuse, exploitation, discrimination, sexual and gender-based violence, early pregnancies, early marriages, and post-traumatic distress order. Refugee is usually the first place these young women can feel secure, protected and cared for after experiencing a very difficult and often traumatic journeys to Nairobi. Whereas Kenya's 2010 constitution guarantees freedom to all refugees to enter, remain, reside anywhere in the country, Kenya has an encampment policy in place that requires all refugees and asylum seekers 
reside in designated refugee camps of Dadao, Akuma, and Kalobei settlement. Most often, they need a movement pass in order to travel outside the camp. However, there is an exception to this policy, and one category of persons being exempted from residing in camps are unaccompanied and separated minors, a very delicate group that gives existence to refugee. Kenya is a party to a number of international treaties and conventions by virtue of Article 26 of, 26 of the Constitution, and they include the 1951 Convention as well as the 1969 OU Convention. Nationally, Kenya has gone a notch higher to enact laws governing the refugee question, and they include the 2010 Kenyan Constitution, the Refugees Act 2006, as well as the Kenya Citizenship and Immigration Act 2011. All these acts guarantee a number of rights, and I'm just going to mention a few. One is access to documentation in order for refugees and asylum seekers to legalize their stay in the country, as well as ensure their access to social services, such as healthcare and employment opportunities. Two is access to basic education to all refugees' children living in Kenya. Now, Refugee, uh, refugee also has a, an arm of advocacy which focuses on refugee protection, child protection, the rights of women and girls. The legal and advocacy program works together with other key stakeholders to ensure that rights of the children and especially unaccompanied and separated minors are upheld and protected. This is done through capacity building and advocacy to the police department Office of the Children Department, the local administration, as well as the Kenyan community at large. As part of advocacy work, Refishi is also a member of the Refugee Bill Task Force. This is a task force that has been put in place to ensure that a new refugee law is enacted. One issue that it seeks to resolve is the encampment policy, which will see all refugees integrate within the Kenyan communities. Refishi recognizes the importance of educating other partners in government, the NGO sector, policy groups, and civil society actors about the challenges experienced by these young women that we serve. Now, when COVID-19 struck the world, Kenya was not spared either. And one major impact that affected our children, the children all over the world was disruption of education. For vulnerable children such as refugees, school is the only safe haven and source of hope for the future. As schools around the world close to prevent the spread of COVID-19, parents, caregivers, and educators responded in stride, finding new ways such as homeschooling and online platforms to keep children learning. Now, while, this, while such learning may take place in urban areas, for many marginalized children in slums of Nairobi, including refugee children, as well as those living with various disabilities, learning during COVID-19 was a deep challenge. To mitigate this impact, Refishi onboarded virtual learning for all the participants and their children. Livelihood was also another aspect that was affected. Due to the stringent measures implemented by the Kenyan government in a bid to prevent the spread of COVID-19, caregivers were not able to do businesses, and many families were plunged into extreme poverty, and children were forced onto the streets in search of food and money, making them easy targets of human traffickers and other abusers. In this regard, Refishi was able to provide food baskets to all the participants as well as safety net for a period of nine months. Ladies and gentlemen, one girl at a time is our mantra, and Refishi continues to be the voice for the voiceless. Thank you very much, and now I'll hand you over to my colleague, Nancy Tamasha. Uh, thank you, Joanne, and hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Nancy Tamasha. I have been with Refishi since 2018 and I work in the case management and safe house program. So the case management program is basically the psychosocial support function of the organization. And we are the first point of contact for all girls received at Refishi. 
So in summary, our typical girl will be unaccompanied or separated and with no means to provide for herself. Uh, she will often be a survivor of sexual and gender-based violence and may have a child or be pregnant as a result of that experience. So basically we are talking about a girl who has been through a lot and is trying to process multiple traumatic events. So then uh, the question we may be asking ourselves is, how do we respond? Uh, one thing to note is that though the girls have similar experiences or similar backgrounds in terms of their flight history, their individual ways of processing these experiences differ from one girl to another. You may, for example, have two girls who are of the same age and uh, both experience separation, but have one coping so much better. She's, um, she's just lively and have another who's completely devastated. We therefore tailor our services according to individual needs. But generally, our first response when we receive a girl is to provide relief. That is physical relief. Um, for example, due to the language barrier that Joanne has talked about, uh, strained access to jobs and public services for refugees in Kenya, we find that most of the girls we receive will have uh, unsuccessfully, unsuccessfully moved from one household to another, trying to make ends meet or just looking for someone to support them. So it's not uncommon for us to receive girls who are severely malnourished, um, their children are sick, and some of whom have been abused. So we therefore uh, see to it that um, each girl and her child, if she has one, have access to basic such as food, um, medicals, and they have a place to stay. And we also address other refugee specific needs such as documentation. And uh, once we've addressed the basics, we then work with counselors to facilitate the girl's psychological and emotional healing. Um, now, obviously this is a process that takes time and may require a range of therapeutic interventions, but usually we will first start by taking a girl through individual counseling where we assess her mental health needs and then group therapy sessions where she's able to hear stories and experiences that are similar to her own. So at Refugee, we receive girls from partners and the community and majority of them will be placed in our girls empowerment program, which is the academic and skill building component of our work. Now, among these girls, there's a category of girls that you receive that have undergone severe trauma and are unable to cope on their own. So for these girls, we place them in our safe house, which is a transitional shelter that provides round the clock support to facilitate healing, recovery, and a sense of safety and security, which is important given what they have gone through. So in the safe house, a girl will have access to counseling, um, mind body activities such as yoga and dance, as well as peer support from other girls, which I have personally witnessed to play a part in their healing. I guess because of that um, great camaraderie, just being among girls who've been through what they have been through, they have a sense of belonging. And as Joanne explained earlier, refugee girls and young women are at risk of early marriage, child labor, sexual exploitation, among others. Now, without education and a means to a livelihood, these risks are multiplied. So the case management team works hard to see to it that a girl reaches a place where she's significantly stable, both physically and psychologically, because only then will she be able to thrive in other areas of her life. For example, in our school program, you will find a girl who is physically and mentally healthy. That will be the girl who will be able to sit in class and concentrate and even have the motivation and esteem to start thinking about her future where she's able to learn a skill and earn a stipend through our social enterprise, which we call the Artisan Collective. Um, I'm sure you've noticed that we have a very holistic approach to how we support a girl, where she not only gets physical relief, but is supported to heal psychologically, and then for sustainability, is empowered through education and access to a livelihood. Our main aim in all this is to empower each girl with the skills and resources required to advocate for her own rights and needs so that in the future, when she's no longer in refugee, she will be able to operate independently, but even more, she'll be able to provide support for other girls in similar situations. So yeah, 
thank you for taking time to listen to us that uh, this far. Back to you, Geoffrey. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Tamasha. The future for refugee and the girls it serves looks as bright as the brilliant, inspiring dreams our refugee gar girls carry. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we are looking forward to scaling up our operations to serve an increasing number of refugees through the following strategic pillars. One, the mental health piece. We plan to deepen and center our mental health services within refugees beneficiaries, and also to scale up to serve other deserving refugees in the community through the use of digital platforms. Secondly, we plan to scale up our e-learning management systems and the wellness platform where we shall offer education life skills training and mental health through digital format to serve remotely many more refugees outside the brick and mortar uh, systems that we currently have. Thirdly, as you all realize, IT has become the in thing in this world. We plan to establish an IT lab and digital skills dissemination to the refugee girls that whom we serve. This will empower the girls to be able to have skills that can help them in employment and also to be able to earn a livelihood. We plan fourthly to develop and scale up our artisan collective, our social enterprise, so that we may be able to engage many more refugee young women in the production of artisan crafts such as scarves and tea towels, and this will be able to help us access deeper, greater portion of the local and international markets through high quality products. It will also help refugee young women who are excluded from employment markets to access livelihood support for themselves and for their families. The proceeds out of it will be plowed back into refugees programming to support many more needy girls. I want to pass it back now to my colleague, Jaylan Adley, to engage a few of the, um, uh, the alumni. But before I do that, I want to basically also um, uh, pass it to ask that uh, we recognize that all that Refugee has been doing has been with great support from a lot of people whom we are truly, truly grateful. Over to you, Jaylan. Thanks so much, Joffrey. And now I am pleased to introduce Semen Talila, our student council president of our Girls Empowerment Program, and Chantal Zuzi, our senior fellow of student and alumni relations. As part of our student council, Semen is the liaison between our girls and our team. She meets often with our team to share concerns and feedback from the girls so that we can continuously improve on our services and address any issues and concerns that the girls have. Samen, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Um, do you want to take a quick moment and introduce yourself and the student council to our audience? Of course. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Samen Talila. I'm from Ethiopia. Uh, I've been in refugee uh, since 2017. Now I'm the student council president. And um, just to say a little bit about the student council, uh, the student council serve uh, a space where the young women in our campus can feel empowered to practice uh, in the decision making uh, process and functioning the GP. Thanks so much, Simen. Um, So I remember during one of my, oh, sorry, go ahead. Um, I remember during one of my first trips to campus, you, you pulled me to the side and you said, I really would love the opportunity to talk directly to our donors on behalf of the girls. Um, I know we had hoped to do that in person and I hope one day soon everyone can come visit in Kenya, but I'm happy that technology is allowing us to, to do it this way. So as student council president, what would you want supporters of refugee to know? Uh, first, thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. And um, I would like the supporters of refugee to know that uh, uh, because of their support, the young women in uh, refugee, me including, are uh, able to get an education, healthcare, and also financial assistance uh, to meet our needs. 
and our children are able uh, to have a better start in school and match their peers. The happy, the joyful kids that you see in, around refugee, it's because of your support has given them a, a safe place to learn and grow. And for that and for more, I would like to say thank you so much on behalf of all refugee uh, uh, participants. Thanks, Simen, and thank you to all of our donors and supporters. Simen, our team talked a little bit about how we had to pivot when COVID-19 hit. Can you describe from your perspective, how did COVID impact the refugee community of girls? Uh, well, uh, in 2020, when COVID-19 pandemic hit, uh, life was really hard for many of us. Uh, we really struggled to adjust the new reality of lockdown and uh, isolation. And for many of us, the stress, the loneliness, and the financial worries made it difficult to get through the day. However, uh, Refugee was always there for us. Uh, they were available to uh, offer us a shoulder to cry on, especially the case management staffs were there and they were always there with us so that we don't give, uh, we don't give up and uh, feel down. And they stepped in and helped us with the financial assistance, which is a, a house rent and food basket. They also provided us an education and healthcare. Uh, the education was through online, uh, that including the uh, vocational training. And with the healthcare, they provided us uh, an emergency car whereby if any girl feel ill, they will come to pick her and take her to hospital. And I really uh, wanna say thank you so much that refugee is a home to all of us. And thank you so much to, to help us through this pandemic. Thanks, Simon. I think we are all hoping this pandemic passes and we can move into a brighter future around the world. Speaking of futures, um, would love to hear from you. What do you envision for refugees future with the right support? Um, with the right support, I see refugee impacting many more lives and uh, refugee offer a lifeline to those who come to Kenya without no support and without no hope for tomorrow. And uh, I want to say I'm so lucky to get this opportunity to join refugee and uh, if, if I couldn't have this opportunity, uh, today my story could have been different. And there are many more girls who are looking uh, for this opportunity and the opportunity that I got. And uh, there are girls who are desperate to get an education. And with the right support, refugee will be able to, uh, to support uh, every girl, every girl who are looking for this opportunity then we will have uh, uh, many more girls' lives and future saved. Thanks so much, Simen. Thank you for all the work you do as Student Council. I know that you are always pushing us to think bigger and better, and so we appreciate your guidance on that. Um, and next, I would love to introduce Chantal Zuzi. She is our Senior Fellow of Student and Alumni Relations and an alumna herself. Given her direct experience with the program, she's working with our team to help us improve our services for students on our campus. And she's also supporting alumna around the world, but especially those resettled in the US to find each other, find resources and be able to connect and support one another. Chantal, hi, would you love like to introduce yourself a little bit about your story, about your work? Thank you, Jalen. <laughs> First of all, I want to thank everyone for having me here today. It, it's such an honor to be here. Well, my name is Chantal Zuzi, and I am originally from the Republic Democratic of Congo, currently residing in Holden, Massachusetts, and a senior in high school. I'm also interning with Refugee, a place I called home before my own resettlement as a senior fellow of students and alumni relations. Well, the direction of my life's purpose was determined by the earliest events of my life. 
At my birth, I was denied basic human rights and justice. I was born an albino. And since in my community, albinos were viewed as outcasts, the only reason I survived was that my parents believed I had the right to live. We had a normal life filled with happiness until I was 13, when everything sadly changed. A massacre occurred in my village and both my parents were killed. These painful events changed my life. I had to become a mother for my siblings, cooking meals for them, making sure that they have clean clothing. I learned early in life to accept responsibilities. After my parents were killed, my siblings and I were forced to run away to a refugee camp in Uganda. Life in the camp was not easy. It was difficult to get water to drink or wash with, food to eat. I would try to find a better place to sleep, always wondering if I will be safe. And not getting any education was a sorrow for me. After three years living in a refugee camp, I fled again from Uganda to Kenya, this time all alone. Arriving in Kenya was when the UN took me to refugee's safe house. This is a place where I met other girls. We all had the same story, just with different beginnings and endings. We've been sexually abused. We've, we've, we have gone to bed hungry. We were girls who had to look after our own children, those father we often did know, didn't know and could not name. We suffered emotional pain. We were all united by all these circumstances that have come to define our lives, events that we did not ask to be part of but were forced into, and somehow we survived. Rifishi held all of us and let us know that we were not alone. They gave us a place, a safe place to call home, food to eat, someone to call mom and dad, and they gave us education. I was really traumatized by my past and sometimes felt that I was reliving my past experiences and it was difficult in the beginning to concentrate in school, but refugee provided me with trauma care, dance, um, Zumba, and we also had like um, counselors, someone to talk to, and as well as yoga. We slept well, we got treated when we were sick, and above all, they empower us with skills like tailoring class, artisan collective, we had to make bags, scarves, dresses, and variety of designs. After two years living at Reshishi, I was then resettled and now living in Holden, Massachusetts with my foster parents, David Fry and Jennifer Fry. Thank you, Jalen. Thank you, Chantal. Thank you for your willingness to share your story. Um, I know it's not always easy to do that, but I know that you also care very deeply to leverage that story to be able to help other refugee women and girls. So thank you for that. Um, and I know now you are looking at universities, you're in a different place, which is incredibly exciting. Um, so can you share a little bit about how you leveraged what you learned at Refugee in your current life now as a resettled alum? Yes, well, my determination brought me to the United States and filled me with the passion to succeed. Well, I was well prepared for my education at Refugee. Arriving here, school work was much easier. I was getting good grades, A's, and my school allowed me to take some college classes at a community college where I made more credit and was able to skip 10th grade. I got a scholarship for a coding class at MIT and I was really, really passionate about my education. And Refugee did not only prepare me educationally, but also with skills. During this COVID-19 pandemic, I was able to make masks and support my community. So the skills that I learned from Refugee have really helped me so much. I, um, I just got um, 
the, I was the winner of the United Way Award, Young Leader Award, for supporting my community and my like my colleagues in school. And it's just um, Rafishi has prepared me also to become a leader and empower other young people to like stand up of their lives and you know move on to the past and just move on to the present. I mean, <laughs> thank you. Thanks, Chantal. Um, I know that you are a big, big advocate for refugees, and it's something that you're incredibly passionate about um, and use your time to advocate as much as you can. Um, so given that, what would you like supporters of refugee to know? Well, refugee have created a future where every single young refugee woman is granted the opportunity she deserves. Your, your generous support have brightened the future of many young women, including mine. You have changed my life, made it better than I could have ever imagined. I am who I am today and who I will become tomorrow because Refishi had the resources needed to support me. I can truly say that you are all my heroes. And uh, by continuing supporting Refishi, you are not only supporting refugee, but you are changing lives. You are preparing leaders of tomorrow. And I just wanna thank you for that. Thank you, Chantal. And I know that on behalf of the team, I can say that you and Semen and the girls are our heroes. Your strength and resilience inspires us every day. You're why we come to work every day. Um, thank you both for being here. Thank you for sharing your story. Um, and without further ado, we want to open this up and take audience questions. Um, I'd like to introduce Shelby Krakenbush, who is our external relations officer. Um, and I know that she has been collecting questions from the audience and we'll ask a few of them here with our time together. Shelby. Thank you, Jaylon, and, and thank you to our team of presenters today. Uh, we would like to take the last 10 minutes or so. I know we're a little bit pressed for time, but we want to answer some of the questions you've submitted. Um, and I will pose them to anyone on our team here today to help answer. Uh, and just a, qu a quick note, if your question isn't chosen, we do encourage you to reach out via email. Uh, as Jalen said earlier, we'll be in touch uh, after the event with some follow-up. Um, so I appreciate everyone who has submitted a question, but we may not get to it today. Um, but the first question I'd like to pose to the team uh, uh, is how long do young women and girls typically stay as part of refugees program? Where do they go after they leave? Right, I can, yeah, sure. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much for that question. Typically, um, a girl will enter into refugee and take three years to do the primary education. We do an accelerated learning education because our girls are typically teenagers between the age of 13 to 23, but most of them are semi-literate or illiterate completely. So they do three years uh, where they do adult education learning on an accelerated model to be able to sit for the primary education. And thereafter, they have another two years where they join the artisan collective. So on average, it's between three to five years, then a girl is exited, either through resettlement or through um, moving out into uh, the community to run their own business. Thank you. Thanks, Joffrey. Uh, we have a few other questions here, um, and I'm gonna pull one now. Uh, how is refugees mission and approach unique to other organizations also working with refugees? Jalen, you want to go? Sure, I'll take this one. Um, so I think what really makes our approach unique is um, the holistic approach, right? Because the girls that we serve are unaccompanied, separated or orphaned, um, it's not just about kind of interventions or services, but we really have to be a home for them, a safe haven. Um, we, you know, our, our team that you just met are really kind of playing all the hats, right? They're a mother, a father, a brother, a sister, on top of being a teacher and a counselor and a case manager. 
Um, we're also very specifically focused on the population um, of unaccompanied minors, specifically and women and girls. There are, you know, a lot of different organizations providing refugee services, um, but when our founders started Refugee, they really found that there was a gap when it came to that most vulnerable population. So we really hone in um, our model for that population specifically. Excellent. And I think we have time maybe for one more question here. So I think, Simen, this one's for you. But how do you, Simen, work with other participants of the program on the Student Council? What are some of your current projects? Um, well, um, uh, we we always ha have a meeting. Uh, whenever uh, a girl has a, a problem, she'll come to us and uh, tell us, and we will go and uh, tell that to the staff that need to know. And uh, the oh, um, how will I say? Sorry. Um, Gilliam, will you help me with this? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so Simen does not hold back. <laughs> I know the camera is a little bit scary right now, but usually she does not hold back and she is quick to point out things that we can do better. Um, feedback from the girls, you know, one of the things that Jeffrey talked about is the IT lab and Simen really pushed that, that, you know, we needed to have more than just tailoring be the vocational option that not every girl wants to be a tailor. Um, we want a modernized skill set. So it was directly from her feedback that we started to really push and find partners and funders so that we can build a robust IT lab and hopefully develop a track for IT. Thank you. You're welcome. Great. Well, I want to thank everyone for joining us today, and I want to be really mindful of time. But there are a lot of great questions that are submitted, so we'll be taking those down and making sure that uh, we get responses to you all. Um, and like we said earlier, please do not hesitate to reach out via email, um, and we'll we'll be in touch very soon. But thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for attending.